and definitely make sure I'm not muted. You're on <laughs> okay, excellent. Hey, welcome everybody to another Tech Week show that we're doing uh, with RMUS. Uh, I'm John McBride, uh, the VP of Technology for RMUS in the United States. Today I'm joined with Kevin Totterall up in Canada um, doing some fun stuff with Autel. So uh, le let me just give it a kind of a broad overview of Autel and our experience with Autel. So Autel a while back uh, when we were uh, doing a little bit more of the consumer stuff brought in a, a great product, uh, the X-Star. Uh, at that time, you know, we had a lot of competition going on in the world of drones and, and we definitely had some experience with Autel and, and from the get-go they, they were very uh, helpful and uh, made a great product. Um, and now they've done a great job pushing more products forward in this enterprise space. So talking about the Evo today, uh, the Evo 2, the Evo 640T, and we have a new surprise for you on something that's coming out, and then as well as the Dragonfish. So we'll be talking about all of these today, but I, but again, just wanted to share our experience. So let me introduce Kevin here. He can give us a little bit of his uh, experience with the Autel product line. I think we've all been uh, highly, uh, what do you want to call it? Just impressed. Is that the word, Kevin? We've been impressed. So throwing it over to Kevin. Let's see what he's got to say about the Autel stuff. Excellent. Well, good afternoon uh, from the uh, Eastern Great White North here. Thanks, uh, John, for the intro. Very exciting. For those of you that were uh, tuned in for our Tech Week kickoff, you'll know that uh, that we and me specifically are big fans of the Autel platform. So um, as I said at the top of that session, uh, it's a great time to be in the small US, UAS market. Lots and lots of opportunities. And if you see uh, why are all the, uh, the DJI product managers scurrying? Well, it's not because of Skydio. It's not because of the Blue SUAS. No, no, no. It is because of Autel, specifically the Evo, uh, Evo platform. It is tremendous. Uh, many of our testing, you might have seen our small SUAS slowdown. Uh, we did a month or so ago. You can check that out on YouTube if you haven't. But in most of the areas, the, the Autel was the top performer, uh, certainly transmission distance, uh, performance, sensing, everything. It, it's fantastic. So huge fans of the platform and definitely uh, definitely a worthy challenger for any of your uh, applications out there. So um, I don't want to hog too much spotlight because uh, in addition to Evo, we've Dragonfish that I know some are very excited about. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw it right over and it's, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Brady Reich from uh, from Autel to get us going. So Brady, why don't you uh, tell us some good stuff, my friend? Sure. Thank you very much, Kevin. Really appreciate it. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Brady Reich. Uh, I am the Enterprise Customer Support Agent with uh, Autel Robotics, and we're here talking, um, as uh, has been discussed a couple times, the uh, Evo 2 platform, a couple different payloads we have, different options, uh, and then we'll move into uh, a couple new things with that platform and then uh, onto the Dragonfish. So first and foremost, uh, for anybody who is not aware with the Evo 2 platform, uh, this is a foldable drone, uh, similar to what some of the other manufacturers have. Basically everything just folds out and you're basically good to go. Once you fold everything out, you take your gimbals off, you're ready to go through the fly. One of the advantages that you have with uh, Auto Robotics, with especially the Evo platform, is that there's no geofencing. So that just simply means we're not going to hold your hand to ensure that you're able to go through to fly where you want to go through and fly. This is completely up to you. Um, I like to say this is kind of like, uh, you know, parents deciding if a teenager is able to take their, you know, take the car out by themselves or if they have to ask for permission. We give you the access to do it. So we trust you to fly. Right. And it's on you as a pilot to go through to fly. So there's no geofencing. We'll give you notifications saying, hey, it's controlled airspace but there's no restrictions. Uh, you can just say, yep, okay, I'm, I'm aware and let's go fly. So one, one of the really cool things, um, aside from the, the geofencing, which is kind of a really big push, is that with this airframe, you're looking at about a 38 minute flight time. So very incredible for something of this size. Um, it is a large battery uh, that it's also a little bit heavier than our first generation with the Evo. This just means that it actually performs better in the wind and we can provide a bigger battery in order to allow you to have that, that 38 minute flight time. Uh, another great thing with it is that we can actually go through and swap the gimbal payloads that we have right here. So this one is the uh, one inch 
6K, uh, the pro gimbal that we have. We also have a couple different thermal options and we have uh, an 8K uh, one over two thirds sensor that you can go through to swap out. This is not required to send in for repair or to an Autel authorized dealer or anything else to swap out. You as the owner can go through and swap this out. Extremely simple. There's four screws and a ribbon cable. You basically just take it off, uh, slip in the new one, put uh, the ribbon cable and the screws back in and you're off and running. Uh, the same application, everything still runs as is. You don't have to download different applications to run it. You don't have to uh, have additional devices, anything like that. Uh, additionally, with uh, with our remote, the great thing about the, the Evo 2 platform is we give you the option to basically put your phone on the top, but this is not required. You can actually press, there's a display button on the back. If you push that button while everything is turned on, you see what the camera sees right on the controller. So you don't even have to have a mobile phone connected at the same time. Let's see here. So, and the uh, the remote is a fold out design. So you can just pull down on the bottom, move your antennas out, just like that. Press and hold to power everything on. Press and hold on the aircraft to turn it on. Let it sit for just a moment uh, so it gets all connected. And then you're off, and off to go and uh, ready to go through and fly. Um, what I wanted to talk about uh, is with the specific gimbal payloads. Uh, recently, we've actually released what we call is the 640T. This one uh, right here, this one is an infrared thermal sensor. This is a 640 by 512, so a very high resolution, 30 hertz refresh. Uh, so if you think of that in terms of frames per second, for example, that just means that it it refreshes so fast that your eye doesn't see the individual frames. Um, unlike some of the other thermal options out there for something of this class, um, the size of the aircraft, a lot of those are gonna be about nine hertz. So you see a lot of streaking and movement back and forth. Uh, with 30 hertz, it's very fast refresh and uh, you don't get that streaking. Um, coupled with the, the very high resolution. Um, and then on top of that, we also have, have a secondary sensor right in this payload. This is the 8K 1 over 2 thirds uh, RGB sensor. So you've got basically the two sensors in one payload. That way it, it mitigates the, the uh, need in order to have multiple gimbals uh, in that case. So that one uh, is uh, currently available. We have another thermal option, which is the FLIR boson. 640 by 512, 30 hertz, so the same specs. Uh, but this one is considered made in the USA with foreign and domestic parts. This means that it's eligible for a lot of governmental gra uh, grants and finances and funds. Um, so any police departments, fire, EMS, uh, anybody else who needs to have that thermal, uh, but have it made in the USA, you're able to do that uh, with a FLIR boson sensor. The only difference between really between the two, uh, aside from, the different manufacturer making the thermal sensor is that the uh, the FLIR rad uh, the FLIR camera the 640 uh, boson is non radiometric um, and really just very high level what that means is that as you take a picture it doesn't retain the temperature value uh, when you look at it in post radiometric keeps that data um, and the 640T which is that infrared thermal sensor uh, that one is radiometric at this time. So we are exploring other options. Uh, we're trying to come out with more gimbals and more payloads available for our customers uh, to fit various different needs um, and requirements. Let's see here. And uh, with that, that's really kind of an overview. Um, I wanted to see if anybody so far had any questions. There's a lot of information that I just kind of threw out there. Um, and if anyone's got anything, feel free to interrupt me. Um, I, I'm a trainer by nature, so I'm, I'm used to being interrupted. No, no problem. Hey, Brady, again, great, great job on the presentation here. I mean, so far, awesome. I, I, I did want to, you know, because I have everything turned on and it's it's up and running. I've got an Evo behind me running the uh, Boson sensor. Um, by the way, I'm still waiting for my 640T. As soon as you can get one to me, that'd be fantastic. You know, anyway, so I've got that running here in the back. Uh, I also have your, uh, how you had, had mentioned that it, you don't need an app or a device uh, connected here. And as far as that ecosystem goes, nice and clean. And then additionally, um, I actually have the the live deck uh, connected to this machine. So uh, if we can jump over to that view real quick, Jace. Uh, there, there's your live deck view. That's coming straight out HDMI from the from the remote or, or connected right to the machine. 
So great for public safety, great for those guys to just have a separate system that is capable of uh, broadcasting that information. You can do it in many different ways. In this way, I've just got it connected to an HDMI, standalone unit. It doesn't need any power. It's got its own battery. I think that's a, this is a fantastic setup right here, by the way, a fantastic setup. Brady mentioned as well, not having geofencing and a bunch of other things that we usually complain about, but I just wanted to touch base on all the other stuff that they combo together here. They actually have a GPC case when you purchase them. So uh, we love GPC, uh, have, a, have a great relationship with those guys. They also can come with the Fox Fury lighting, this little kit on the side that they come with. And that's all comboed up with it. You know, even an, even a little SD card holder that gets thrown in the box, you know, just, just a really fantastic combination of stuff that uh, we don't have to try to kit out all the time. It's already kitted out for you. So just really great job. Uh, trying to push that as far as questions goes. I've got two of them, but um, Let's see if Brady can hit these I just wanted to again talk a little bit about that about how impressed I am with uh, you know Autel just working with other companies here in the United States as well pushing out those products. So uh, Joel B asks um, Is there any future iteration with FLIR tools compatibility? I think you answered that one Brady where we don't have FLIR tools working with a non radiometric imager but the imager on the 640T, if I stand corrected, is not a FLIR sensor. If you wanted to elaborate maybe a little bit on your uh, IR tool that I think you guys have got that's uh, being put out there. Absolutely, great question. So yes, um, as of right now, it is not compatible with FLIR tools because the FLIR boson sensor uh, that is uh, aimed specifically towards public safety and things like that is non-radiometric which means that, again, you cannot use it with uh, a uh, the FLIR tool system because it's looking for that radiometric data. However, as John had mentioned, yes, with our 640T, the infrared thermal sensor, it is not FLIR based, which means that it does not work in FLIR tools. However, we are, going, we are um, actually creating our own um, FLIR tools equivalent with the IRPC tool, which does work with the radiometric data from the 640T. And that's just available on our website um, at autodrones.com. Uh, you can go to the uh, the 640T and then jump under the technical support. And it's actually a link, and I can provide that later if you like. Uh, so we do have something that is equivalent at this point, but as far as the FLIR boson, it is not currently available with the FLIR tools. Um, although that may be something that uh, that is updated in the future. Okay, excellent. You know, a lot, a lot of that FLIR tools compatibility comes with the way the file structure is, is, is actually made. So that, that has a lot to do with it. We can discuss all that thermal stuff as well. But remember, FLIR tools is usually made for that proprietary FLIR file type. And so since these don't always qualify as being that, FLIR tools isn't available. But it's great to see that Autel is actually creating an equivalent program to that. And I'll throw a, a a little thing out here that Douglas Spotted Eagle, I think today, if I stand corrected, today has got a webinar today uh, explaining the Autel 640T as well as the uh, uh, the the uh, program in which you can do some tuning. So I'm actually going to tune into that myself mm -hmm. today, Brady. I'm just letting you know. Douglas, watching your show today. You better do a good Perfect. job. So um, the last one is, uh, or the other question that we have here, well, it's a dual question from Steve, you know, what, where is it made in the USA? That's a pretty easy question, I think. It's not necessarily made in the USA, but Brady, if you wanted to elaborate on that, but then the second part is just what is the reception distance from the remote slash, not the remote, it's connected to the bird. So remember this, this is connected to the bird. It's not actually uh, bound to the other remote, like the Inspire designs. In the Inspire designs, we couldn't get too far away from each other. So this can be pretty far away because it's actually connected to the bird. So I, I guess I already answered that. How far, as far as the remote or as far as the others can go. But maybe you can just let us know a little bit about this Autel, Chinese, USA, you know, what are, what are you guys trying to do to, to, to really meet that, you know, that thing? What, what do you got there, Brady? Yeah, so uh, of course, uh, everything's cheaper in China, right? Uh, that's really what it boils down to. However, Autel is actually trying to bring things here stateside as much as possible, start to bring the uh, the engineering, uh, try to bring in the actual manufacturing and things like that. So we are actively uh, looking at different options in order to bring it here to the US to become 
made in the USA, right? So um, as of right now, the FLIR boson, right, the non-radiometric uh, thermal camera that we have is currently made in the USA with foreign and domestic parts. This means that, again, the aircraft, you can have all different payloads on this one aircraft, right? I can purchase that FLIR boson thermal sensor separately and attach it to this aircraft. This aircraft is what is manufactured abroad. However, the FLIR boson thermal sensor, because it is FLIR based, is here in the US, right? Uh, so we're able to put uh, that sensor into the gimbals here locally, actually up in Bothell, Washington. And then once they're put together, uh, because there is so much of the aircraft, right? Most of the price of the aircraft is in that sensor because there's a certain threshold there. Uh, we can then consider it to be made in the USA with foreign and domestic parts. So the sensor itself is all in the US. However, the aircraft is, uh, is what's based, being made uh, abroad at this time. Uh, excellent. You know, as far as the the overall, I know, you know, as far as compliance goes in, in the United States and everything else, there's always people alluding to that, you know, of like, well, we can't buy, we can't buy. And, and, and we get that, you know, I think we I think Autel absolutely understands this and is, it, you know, as far as you guys making strides to make that happen. Another checkbox of awesome things that Autel are doing. Kevin, did you have something to add to this as far as the question part before we turn it back over to Brady with the presentation? Did you have something to add? I did, John. Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, so two two points I wanted to do. Um, uh, we we got asked a lot about streaming, so it's it's important. There is a couple of hack ways where you can take the live deck and use uh, use Facebook Live or or YouTube for live streaming. But obviously, for public safety, it's not secure. But there are some tools. Remember, there's an HDMI out right from the live deck, so you could plug into something like an AVG box uh, and be able to stream live securely off that for, uh, for that kind of solution. The second thing that Brady touched on that I think is very important for particularly for public safety departments as they're doing their planning um, for smaller and medium departments is going to be the fact that that camera is interchangeable and modular. And, and Brady just said it there about a minute ago, which is most of the cost of the camera is that high-end IR sensor. Those things are expensive. And so for a lot of your applications, if you're doing accident scene mapping or basic mapping, you, you don't need that. You, in, you can, your best bet actually is to go with the, with the one inch 6K sensor. That's probably the best sensor for mapping on those smaller aircraft. But what it does is allow you that flexibility if you're trying to build your program, you can start off with a 6K for your traffic people. And then if you do start to expand, you can continue to buy the 6K and then just add those sensors separately and either have them in a kit where you're only flying the sensor you need, or you have uh, say four aircraft and only two of the high-end sensors. But there's a lot of ways you can now configure things to save yourself some money and lower your uh, your risk of what you're flying around. So that's actually a really huge and important feature for how you go about deploying this out in the field. Right? Yeah, Back great, to you, great, great points. Like I said, I mean, just the ability to, to swap payloads on a small aircraft. You know, we we've learned that swapping payloads and changing those those cameras has definitely been beneficial. Um, isn't very complicated to do as far as the process of doing it, but you do want to have you know probably set it up for the mission that's ready to go. It's not quite as easily hot swappable as, as other systems out there, but you know, as far as getting it ready to go for whatever mission it is, doesn't take very long to do it and very simple to understand. Anyway, let's throw it back to Brady here. We do have a couple more questions, but we'll hold those and let Brady kind of keep pushing us forward here on, on more information because there's more other fun stuff that he's going to talk about. So go ahead, Brady. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, the next thing that I want to touch on um, at, at this point is that we also have uh, coming out here soon is the EO2 RTK, uh, which is on the same, uh, essentially the same aircraft that we have now, uh, except on the front, it's going to basically have a uh, RTK mounted system that will give it much accurate uh, locational data when you're trying to do photogrammetry, repeat missions in the same um, exact area, things like that. So that is something that is coming out. Uh, currently, it's not available yet. Uh, we do have a list of um, ongoing people who are interested as soon as we have more information on 
uh, pricing availability with our authorized dealers uh, selling, we are making those lists. So either reach out to the authorized dealers, uh, reach out to us directly, and we'll basically put you back in touch with, uh, with the dealer once they are available. Um, and this is going to be incredible for being able to capture data um, on the go. If, you're, if you've got a uh, mapping mission or anything else, uh, there is a base station we are currently working on uh, in order to make sure you, you're able to triangulate, connect to your local uh, surveying network, uh, likely an NTRIP network. Um, and assure that you have uh, a whole lot of different types of satellites to get you much more positional accuracy. Um, so that's something that we're really excited for that is coming out here soon. Um, and again, all the payloads that we are talking about right now are compatible with the RTK system. Because it is essentially the same airframe, you just have uh, some extra connections on top for the RTK system, the camera payload doesn't matter. So. As Kevin mentioned, the 6K 1-inch uh, Pro sensor, this is ideal for mapping, right? That's, that's actually what I like to do uh, primarily. So that 6K 1-inch sensor is fan phenomenal. It gets you a whole lot of data um, and very sharp and clear information so that you can process your photogrammetry in whatever program you're utilizing. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, on top of that, what I also want to talk about, and uh, at, as of this time, we are very close to a release. Uh, some of you may or may not have heard about the Autel Smart Controller. So the Smart Controller is fantastic. So essentially take this controller and basically beef it up quite a bit. Uh, what we're gonna have is a larger tablet that you're able to utilize. Uh, you still have your same control inputs. You've got your uh, pause and, and return home buttons. You still have all your uh, dials and switches. It's just in a much larger platform. Um, and what happens is that this is going to be Android based. It's going to run the same Autel Explorer application on your mobile device that it does. And when that's running, uh, the, the great thing about the smart controller is the size of the screen and the brightness of the screen. So the size of the screen is just under eight inches. I think it's 7.9 uh, inches from corner to corner. And then we have a maximum nit brightness of 2000 nits, which is pretty incredible. So it, in bright daylight, you will have no problem seeing your screen. Um, this allows you to uh, get rid of any smart or mobile device that's connected. Uh, this way there's less, uh, I, I guess, issues uh, moving forward. So there's, uh, you don't have to worry about bad cables. You don't have to worry about other failure points. It's all built into one system. Um, on top of this, uh, you're looking at about a four and a half hour battery life. Uh, it's got internal storage of 128 gigs. Uh, you can actually get a micro SD card and put it into the controller itself up to one terabyte. So you can have tons of storage on the controller itself um, and uh, be able to transfer that from the uh, aircraft back to the, uh, <laughs> to the smart controller. <laughs> uh, we're, we're looking at about a 13 kilometer range. Uh, so it's just over eight miles. So of course you have a much larger antenna than the stock here. Uh, you, you can customize those and change those on the smart controller, but because they are much more powerful, you can get much further transmission um, as well as deeper penetration into heavy urban, urban environments. So you don't have the breakup and things like that. Um, and then uh, on top of that, you can also, just like the live deck, you're able to have that HDMI output going to a TV or to another computer or um, to a, a, a capture box, anything like that. The smart controller also has a USB and an HDMI out. So you can not only share it from the live deck to a device, but you can also share it from the smart controller to another device as well. So we're, we're really excited to have that coming out. Uh, we are accepting pre-orders, uh, so make sure you contact, uh, you know, your, your uh, local dealer. So RMUS, just hit them up and say, hey, I want the smart controller, and we can start uh, getting that all set up for you. Here we go. Uh, Brady, that, that obviously was my smart controller happy dance, if you didn't see that in the middle of that. Uh, yep. Jace, you know, great job pulling me in there. I mean, oh, my gosh. So we, we, we know the value of a smart remote. We get it. You know, I mean, it, it's out there. DJI has one. Uh, having the all in all in together thing some of the blue UAS are coming out with you know these embedded you know devices inside of their stuff as well so so we we, we see that um, but I think again all of the all of the numbers you're talking about here the capabilities and everything else are just kind of what exactly you know taking your time to develop something like that instead of just throwing it out there 
Uh, dang it, another checkbox for Autel, man. I mean, it's just fantastic uh, as far as that goes. I didn't want to stop anything, you know, we'll just keep talking, but I just wanted to say how uh, happy sure. I am to kind of see that this is coming. Happy to get one of those in my hands and try to test them out. So, uh, yeah, continue on, my man. I just had to throw the smart controller happy dance in there. I, it's fantastic. Sure. <laughs> Yeah, we're, we, uh, like, like I said, we, we're extremely excited to, to bring it and, and yes, taking our time on it. Sure, we weren't the absolute first person to have the smart controller. You're, you're right on that. But it's better to take your time and make sure that you have the product right before it comes out. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we're really excited to bring that in. And, and again, for um, any of the pre-orders, make sure you're, you're reaching out and letting uh, ArmUS know um, any of the, your authorized dealers who you want to talk to. Um, it, it's a fantastic product and it's it's coming very soon. So we should have more information uh, coming soon as far as when it will be available. Um, as of uh, basically this time, I don't have that information just yet. Um, so that's really uh, it as far as the smart controller um, and with the Evo 2 series. Um, I just wanted to ask again, if anybody has any additional questions with the Evo 2 before we start moving on to uh, things like the Dragonfish. And I wanna make sure we have enough time at the very end for any additional questions that are coming through that uh, that were missed as well. Yeah, we're doing well. I mean, we still have about another half hour of the presentation if you're still with us and watching. And again, so far, awesome mm -hmm. as far as the presentation goes. So let's uh, let's see if we can hit some quick questions here. Um, lightning round question. Yeah, yeah, lightning round. Here we go, Brady. Is there is the RTK going to be able to be attached to the Evo 2, or do you have it to buy a new drone? So I think I, you know, we kind of understand that question. It, Currently, it's not there. You'd have right. to buy a different version. Correct. It, it would be a separate version of the uh, the Evo 2. Uh, but everything guys... else, the batteries, the payloads, everything else would be compatible. Um, okay. It's just the airframe because it has to physically mount to the top. Where the uh, where the GPS unit is currently. Okay, fair enough. I mean, so that makes sense. It's kind of a similar, probably to the enterprise version of a DJI, where they have two separate Mavics. You know, you have the the, the enterprise side that has the attachments, mm -hmm. and so something similar. Is that what we can expect? Yes, yes, it, it'll be something uh, very similar to that. Okay. Uh, because you've got two little thumb screws, and you have the little uh, pins in the center uh, when that's all connected. Okay, excellent. Um, Jonathan asks here, is it possible to upload KML files for pre-programmed flights? I think that kind of depends on the app that you're using, but maybe, you know, can you maybe go into how, mm -hmm. you know, the apping side of the uh, of the Autel Explorer app works? Sure. Can you bring in KML? Is that possible? Yes, you, uh, it, at this time, it's not currently available, but it's coming within the next uh, update or two. So um, I did then get that confirmation from the engineering uh, actually about two weeks ago. So we should be able to import and export the, uh, the file. So if you have it loaded, say, for example, to your mobile phone and you want to synchronize it with your smart controller, you can certainly import and export that because it's all using the same uh, Android application or iOS application. Mm -hmm. So that is coming very, very soon. And just, just to let it be known, there are, of course, third-party apps that can do this, you know, as long as they're compatible with the Autel Evo 2 series or whatever that you're flying, just make sure they're compatible with it. But I do know, you know, that's been a pretty, you know, standard workflow is to bring in a third-party mm -hmm. app that handles KML ingestion and then outputs whatever you want and flies the machine. But I personally like the native apps as much as I can use them. Third party has always been kind of challenging for me, so just just something out there. They're not always perfect. They don't always work right, but you know I like the native apps. Um, and uh, from Tim, you know, how is Autel planning to address the upcoming remote ID requirements for the FAA? Uh, I'm sure everybody wants to know a little bit about that as far as a manufacturer goes. But you know, have you guys mm -hmm. had any insight on maybe some direction on remote ID? You don't have to go too much into detail because I don't even know if there's details available from the FAA to even understand how to comply. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm sure it's on your roadmap. Right. Yes, it, it is certainly on the roadmap and, and you hit the nail on the head. Um, as of right now, the FAA has not released the information exactly on how we're supposed to uh, encrypt that data, how it's supposed to be broadcast, what frequencies are to be used, and um, all the nitty gritty details that we as a manufacturer need to have in order to generate something that will be compliant moving forward. So at this time, unfortunately, I don't have an answer for you because we're still waiting on that from the FAA. It seems like it was a little, uh, you, you know, uh, ahead of where it should have been released to the public, letting them know what's happening. 
uh, maybe work out all the details. But as soon as we have all the information uh, transmitted to us from the FAA, we will uh, basically take uh, a week or two to go through all the information, dig into it, and figure out if it's going to be something we can uh, add as a software update to be able to transmit or if it's going to be hardware based. And then if we're going to be able to produce something uh, for like the Evo 2 series uh, in order to comply with the, the remote ID regulations. Mm. Yeah, I would imagine that, you know, it's kind of a kind of an up and down thing right now with manufacturers. You know, I know I know of some people that are already trying to come up with attachments that you just add to the drone, you know, one single item, mm -hmm. put it to the drone. It's your it's that that is the plan. That is the way they're they're planning on doing. But to have a manufacturer actually embed something into the drone to to meet remote ID still kind of questionable. So hopefully hopefully that's helpful. Um, last one before we move on here and let you kind of continue on. Um, is from Steven. Uh, are you looking at doing a, a higher resolution camera? I know that the, you know, as far as resolution goes, that's kind of been the, you know, a lot of people pushing towards that direction. I want 48 meg, I want, you know, something high in the, in the megapixel to take, mm -hmm. you know, global shutter shots, a nicer picture, anything in the, in the future for that? So as of right now, to my knowledge, uh, there isn't anything necessarily on the roadmap that I'm aware of. Um, of course, on the R&D and the engineering team, they've got a completely different roadmap uh, to what is able to, to come out. So as of right now, I, I'm not as sure on that one. Uh, what I like to tell people is, you know, when, when say people say, hey, is, do you want to purchase the 8K or the 6K? Which one's better? Because the 8K is 48 megapixels while the uh, the one at 6K is only 20 megapixels. So uh, megapixels, I think, is really a, a sales point for a lot of people uh, who may not uh, understand how the megapixels are actually generated, right? So you've got your, your X times your, uh, your Y, essentially, for the resolution size. Um, and even though the 6K is a lower megapixel, it's a much larger sensor size. It's almost twice the size. Uh, so because of that, you get more dynamic range. Um, on, on top of that, I like to ask people, do you know anybody, and, and I'll ask you specifically, John, do you know anybody that has a 6K TV? Uh, I, I do not, uh, not at all. You know, in fact, like I said, <laughs> the only thing I see is when Jace tells me he doesn't mind recording in a higher uh, 6K, 8K because of the editing purposes, mm -hmm. but not for playback purposes. It's very rare that people push back in, in you know, 6K, you know, playback but for mm -hmm. editing i can see that um, but your explanation there is perfect you know of just mm -hmm. understanding how how do you utilize the 8k size you can pull a fairly large megapixel you know mm -hmm. image from an 8k video you know if it's there so anyway uh did, did you know like i said yeah. we'll, we'll keep running along um as far as uh, other questions i've got some more that are coming but we'll hit those here in a bit i i know that you have some some other stuff you want to talk about so back to you brady <laughs> sure <laughs> all right thank you uh so yeah that so I, at this point uh we've talked about the the evo 2 aircraft all the different payload options the uh, the rtk that's coming out um uh, and the uh, smart controller as well which will uh work with the evo 2 platform uh, the next thing I'd like to jump into is actually with our dragonfish. Um, if anyone's keeping up with the the UAS world, uh, we're making waves uh, quite literally with the uh, the aircraft. Uh, it, it's a large VTOL, which is just a vertical takeoff or landing, uh, com commonly referred to as vertical takeoff and land. Uh, with this aircraft, you're able to set it up in uh, in an enclosed environment. The wingspan is uh, about uh, I think it's 6.8, uh, almost seven feet um, across for the wingspan. So it is fairly large, uh, but this actually is, uh, when it first takes off is actually in a quadcopter mode and then we'll transition into a fixed wing mode. Uh, so if we can go ahead and bring up the image, um, I'll go ahead and just explain on how the aircraft does fly. So uh, with the, uh, the image, once we can get this up, uh, if we look on the left-hand side of the image at first, you'll have your rotor takeoff altitude. Um, so what's going to happen is that the aircraft is going to take off vertically straight up until your predetermined transitional altitude. Then it will uh, basically tilt the wingtips forward, and then the two props on the center fuselage will, uh, will stop. So it is strictly only into a fixed wing mode. 
Then what it's going to do is it will circle, or what we do, our, our circle up point, um, it will actually do circles in a uh, predefined area in order to get to its mission altitude, right? Or the waypoint altitude that you want to go through to fly it at. The aircraft will fly um, at this predetermined altitude. Um, if you want to set it to 375 feet, uh, then of course the aircraft will be 375 feet from uh, where it had taken off. You'll do your waypoint missions, whether you're tracking something, whether you're mapping an area um, with your predetermined missions. And then what will happen is that once it's finished, it will come to its circle down point, which you can overlay the circle up and circle down points. Um, it will basically come in still as a fixed wing. It'll basically do circles in order to decrease its altitude to a predetermined height, right? Then it will come back towards the, uh, the launch or land area and then it will transition back into a quadcopter, right? So when all four blades are gonna be spinning, uh, the wingtips are, are uh, facing up, so it reacts just like a, a large quadcopter does. And then it's going to descend uh, just like the EVO-2 does essentially back into the launch and land uh, position. So the great thing about the Dragonfish is that you don't need a, uh, a large area in order to throw the aircraft like some of the other ones. There's no slingshot mechanism. Uh, you're not crash landing the aircraft into the ground in order to retrieve it uh, like some of our competitors. So again, um, at the beginning and the end, everything below this orange line here it is actually in a quadcopter mode when you have four different rotors spinning. Everything above the orange line is when it will uh, transition and then continue to fly in a fixed wing mode uh, where you only have the, the propellers on the right and left actually spinning. So uh, with that, uh, I mean, it, it's incredible um, for search and rescue, for public safety. Uh, this is really important to be able to get the aircraft up and running quickly and get it operational in a small area while you can basically climb above the buildings or uh, anything else that you're around. If there's towers, just make sure you've got uh, the appropriate height set. Uh, but you can actually go through and loiter and track and uh, fly your missions up above things, come back, um, and then transition back into the quadcopter to land in a small confined area again. Uh, so it's, it's really incredible with, with that aircraft and, and what we're able to do. Um, what I'd like to uh, touch on with the Dragonfish is, as of right now, we have two separate payloads. Uh, the first one is a dual payload. This one is a uh, 48 megapixel uh, uh, 4K sensor. That's a, a little one that basically just sits on the bottom left corner as you're facing the same direction as the aircraft. Uh, the other sensor is actually a 4K 20 times zoom uh, optical up to 200 times digital zoom. So it, it's incredible for tracking. Um, so what I'll actually ask is that we go ahead and pull up uh, the video that we have set up as well. And just kind of let this play in the background while we talk about what's happening. So on the left, you'll see the live feed from the uh, aircraft when we were going through to flight. On the right, you'll actually see the application that we have uh, as the Autel Voyager application on the, the new controller for that. So as of right now, we've just gone through um, and lifted up to our predetermined altitude. Now we're going up to our circle up point, um, if you can see that there. So we are now starting our, our circular pattern and we are starting to climb if you look on the right hand side. So as we're climbing, our um, ascent or our circle up and our circle down points are nearly identical. These are areas that we are aware that uh, we don't have trees or buildings in the way. Uh, we are clear to go, so no problems there. So now we're gonna go ahead and transition. We are now at our, uh, our flight altitude. We are now gonna follow, uh, there's a green line and it might be a little bit difficult to see it on, on the screen there because this is just a screen recording. Um, and we gotta love the, uh, the webinars. So we're actually tapping uh, now on the screen, on the tablet, uh, in order to reframe whatever we're looking at. Remember that because this is in a fixed wing mode, it is constantly moving forward, right? This is something that uh, you'll have to kind of understand um, and practice with to really get your uh, a hang on what's happening here because it's not flying like a traditional quadcopter. So as we come around, we're basically gonna hit our waypoint one. We're gonna make a loop 
And then what we're going to do is we're going to start tracking something. Uh, so right in this little uh, swamp area behind our, our main headquarters, um, I basically just tap on the screen um, and you'll see that we did hit our limit, which is another thing I'll talk about in just a moment uh, with the gimbal. But I tap on the screen and I'm, I'm looking to see, hey, is there anybody uh, walking on the paths? You have a, uh, an optical zoom on the tablet that you can go through and change on the screen or on the right hand side of the tablet, there's also a little uh, toggle uh, that you can basically push forward or back and have it zoom on the side without taking your fingers off the controls. So you'll see there's some uh, white, kind of looks like targets, right? When you're looking at something on the ground, it says, hey, I think I recognize something here. So I can zoom in and we get a much solid or a, a much more solid link. And then once we tap on that, now we're tracking something. So this uh, lady in the, uh, the white and the black, and she's got her little child there. It looks like uh, her husband's a little family likely um, and, their, and their pet. So right now, the aircraft has deviated from its pre-planned mission. So we have specifically told the aircraft, hey, I want you to look in this area um, until I tell you to stop. Then we just go ahead and hit stop, and it said it has exited the, uh, the tracking. Now we are returning back to our mission. Um, and, and I'm sorry, I was looking at the uh, remote here and that's why it's kind of zoomed in. You'll, so you'll see it zoom out here in just a moment as we uh, go through and get everything centered. There we go. So now we're returning back to our predetermined mission. So at any point in time, if you say, hey, that's something I need to go look at, you can deviate from it at any time. As of right now, my, my thumbs are off the sticks. I am not flying this aircraft. It is all automated. All we're doing is tapping on the screen to look in a specific area or a specific location uh, and letting the aircraft fly itself in the fixed wing mode. So what's gonna happen here uh, as we're coming around, you'll notice I've locked the camera just so you can see what happens here. When we lock the camera in a specific direction, even if the aircraft turns, you'll see the aircraft or the uh, camera looking in that same direction. So it does not deviate. Uh, what you can do is on the left-hand side, there's some camera controls that uh, I was kind of playing with a little bit earlier, uh, where you can point the camera straight forward, you can look straight down, nadir, you can basically adjust yaw or just the pitch, um, and you can make those adjustments as needed. So as we're coming around now, you'll notice on the map there's a yellow circle, right, with a flag. This is a predetermined mission, and we've said, hey, there might be something in the middle of this flag or in this area, I want you to look at it. So you'll see as soon as the aircraft crosses by that, uh, that yellow uh, circle, you're going to see our camera flip around in just a moment here. I'm just going to look at the center of where that flag is. Right. So right there, I didn't touch the camera in order to change it. It automatically said, hey, I'm going to look at this this area because my flight path is within the the yellow circle. As soon as we leave the yellow circle, the camera will go back to whatever was set previously. So we're about to go ahead and exit from that circle or from the, uh, the flag area and we're pointed back down Nadir, which is what it was as soon as we uh, went into the uh, the yellow circle flagged area. So I just went ahead and uh, centered our aircraft or the, centered the camera on the aircraft. And the great thing, uh, like I said, at any point in time, you can go through and track something. You can uh, change anything you need to. Uh, if for any reason we had an emergency and we had to manually fly, there is a physical toggle on the actual remote that will change it back from automated to manual. What happens is if I keep it or if I change it from my automated flight, uh, into manual, what's going to happen is that the aircraft, unless I'm pushing forward to give it forward momentum, it's going to stop, which would typically cause a stall with uh, a fixed wing aircraft. So when the aircraft determines that there, there could be a stall, what's going to happen is it will automatically transition back into a quadcopter mode. So if I flip it to manual and I keep my thumbs off the stick, it's going to basically go through and uh, change the uh, the props on the side of the wings and it's going to start up the props on the fuselage. So then it will stop and then it will just hover just like a normal uh, quadcopter would. So you can fly it in a quadcopter mode. Uh, you cannot fly an automated uh, quadcopter mode just because it's far less efficient for the aircraft. Uh, but if it's in the uh, automated mode, you're looking at about a two hour flight time in quadcopter mode. You're looking at maybe 45 minutes uh, just because it's far less efficient in that mode. 
So we're coming down, we hit our uh, circle down point already. We're now transitioning back because we're just about over our launch location and now it's transitioning and we're essentially stopping right there. And then we basically just come straight down and we land the aircraft. So very simple to use, very intuitive. Uh, we also have uh, a lot of different training materials, different things that we can uh, go through and teach you how to do stuff. So we're really looking forward to uh, to getting this in your hands, John so, and uh, Kevin, so you guys can go through and play with this uh, this dragonfish as well. So uh, as we let the uh, the video finish, there's probably 15 seconds or so. Okay, there we go. And uh, let's see here. So I just wanted to see if there are any other questions or anything else uh, that you guys have. I mean, I know we're running at about uh, 10 minutes left. I want to give plenty of time for questions and anything that you guys have for me as well. Doing really well on time, you know, and, and presentation. Um, God, that thing is impressive. I'm, I'm not going to lie. So, so probably the, one of the most common things that I've been requested to integrate is having a camera that, that can do this from a, a VTOL or a fixed wing. That's probably the most commonly requested item is, uh, you know, even mm -hmm. on uh, Quantum Systems Trinity, which is basically a mapping camera, uh, it's not, it's got LiDAR capabilities, other things that you can put on there, but public safety was always asking for that ability to to point somewhere, control the gimbal, get this, this back to us, you know, as far as uh, uh, public safety goes, you know, that particular use case. Um, this can come into other things too, you know, file, wildfires, uh, monitoring security places, you know, these things that are just there. Um, that's kind of what it seems like it's made for. Kevin, do you have any input on that as far as like any, any of your, uh, you know, military constituents up there in Canada that would be very impressed with such a, such a device? Well, I think I think when you see it, you'll probably be impressed with it. And so, for uh, for our good uh, Canadians up here, we will have one of these up here shortly. So, once we uh, get a few more vaccines pumped in, people will have these out in the field. But, but absolutely, I mean, uh, obviously, we work with Wingdrop here, and it is a terrific, uh, I think, the best platform for mapping. But uh, for our public safety partners and and forestry, especially who are working with that need these broader areas and need um, and need that different kind of center options. This is absolutely perfect uh, in addition to all the tracking. And so um, and we're, we're excited to to, uh, to have it up here uh, for, for people to try out. Um, obviously, we're a big country up here, so we've got a lot of open uh, open spaces that we want to uh, uh, have yeah. a look at. Yeah, super, super. <laughs> right. I mean, that that's the thing is just, you know, when you really have, you know, areas that you have to cover things you got to watch you know real time versus to going out and doing a mapping mission this definitely pushes that now um yeah let's let's go ahead and do some questions if you're okay with that brady we'll just you know i got a couple more yeah. here yeah let's uh let's see um is the rtk version this is from mateo is the rtk version going to be re released during 2021 is that when's the expected release date on your on your enterprise versions or do you have an idea on when those will be available here uh in the united states um i i don't have an exact time frame when that will be available um i'm assuming it will probably be uh around the the end of uh q2 or sometime in q3 is my guess uh, but again, that's all personal guess. That's not on behalf of Autel. That's just mm -hmm. what I think uh, because of the way that the industry is going, uh, where we're at in the development process. Um, but it, uh, it, I believe it should be out sometime this year. Yeah. Are, are we going to be able to connect, you know, another RTK question? This is kind of from Christian. Are we going to be able to connect to mm -hmm. other base stations? How does that process work? I know, you know, everybody has a different way that they do it. They've got their own base station. They connect to an NTRIP server. They go through a Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or their own thing. Uh, this alludes to a PPK question as well. So, you know, do you know a little bit about that process? Or are we still kind of early in the game? It's still early in the game. Uh, the plan is to have it available for uh, different systems. So it's not just uh, something that you have to purchase from Autel. It can be a uh, third party as well. Uh, that's the end goal. Uh, but as of this point, I haven't seen a model that we're able to do that with yet, but that is on the radar. Mm. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, um, let's see. I think we hit that PPK question there, Christian. Um, sorry, kind of jumping through this real quick. 
Uh, yeah, Brady. Well, well John's digging out. Oh, go well, ahead. Go John's ahead. Digging out. Yeah, I was. I just wanted to talk, Gay, to talk a little bit about some of the uh, the uh, accessories on the Exolander. Lander. Uh, I'm not sure if you've got a got a D10 unit for the Spotlight, or we want to talk just briefly on those because sure. I do think the part is real powerful for this. Sure, absolutely, and, and uh, good call. It's just I, I'm trying to make sure we've got enough time and uh, not going to keep people. Uh, but yes, We're I good. actually do have uh, an an exit lander right now. So this will connect to any aircraft uh, for, from the Evo 2 series. This, this means any that have uh, the RTK or or uh, anything else, um, any of those systems. This uses the same harness that we have as uh, as the night night flight uh, requires basically uh, lights or as it did require lights, I'll, I'll say that. Um, uh, specific lights. So we're actually partnered with Fox Fury uh, that actually has these uh, D3060s. They have a light on the front and they have a light on the side. They have two different buttons to uh, adjust each one independently. So we can go through and change that. And we now have our strobe. So now we comply with our 10729 or the night flight, same with the front. So this connects to there's seven different mounting points on this harness, one on the top, two on each side, and then two basically underneath right here. But right now I've got my exit lander connected. So really uh, there's only about five connections at this point. So with the uh, the exo lander, we have a D100 light right here, which is incredibly bright. And it's gonna wash you out here for a second. <laughs> it's, it's nuts um, at nighttime and we can go through and strobe and then turn that off. Uh, this one uh, just uses pretty typical uh, 18650 batteries in the back. Uh, they're all just thumb screws, so I can put this all together uh, without having any specialized tools. So essentially, this is the harness on the top. You've got two connections, front and back, for the exit lander. You have the D100 light that you get, and then it also has a manual drop release system. And, and I'm pretty sure that you've already taken a video. Uh, so if you want to put a video of that up, uh, essentially, we just put everything up here. Uh, someone holds onto the cable down below and then we will drop whatever payload that uh, we have attached. So this is great for public safety, for search and rescue. Um, you know, if you need to give someone a radio, uh, some food, some water, because it might take a few more hours before the, uh, the actual uh, rescuers are able to get to your position, right? So there's many different uh, options to allow that. But yes, it is a manual drop system. You've got um, about a 25-foot uh, paracord, um, and everything is just connected using a carabiner. So you can use any bag that you want, uh, anything with a clip. Uh, it's, it's really up to you uh, to determine what you want to go through and drop. Fantastic. Yeah, so I, I think just to comment on that, so I, I, I've i seen a lot of these new products and things like that, and so I tend to be very skeptical about stuff. And the first thing I thought when I saw that is, uh, oh, it's it's not that fancy. And then I said, yeah, there's no way in hell it's going to work. You're going to you're going to pull that out of the sky and it's going to crash and it's going to be bad for everybody. So the guy and I actually took that video uh, expecting it to crash. And uh, the guy you're seeing there is a real person. He's not an actor, uh, though he could be. That's Eric Blomendahl, our director of sales. And so that's totally legit. You saw that thing. It, it barely budged. Uh, and that thing is a great example of a simple system that that works, right? If you need to get something there, and again, you're not going to put a chainsaw on that thing, um, but you could put a decent thing there. It's it's you know for doing it, it's great. And so I I, I tip uh, I tip my uh, my toque to you guys up here. Thank All you. Right. Yeah, and it, as you mentioned, there's a, a 1.8 uh, basically a payload. Uh, that you're able to add to the aircraft uh, before it hits its limit. So what it's able to carry is a lot of different things. I, I'm sorry, John, <laughs> the, the little bit of a delay on our side, but uh, go ahead. Well, I was just saying, who would ever put a chainsaw on the bottom of a drone, Kevin? Like, who would ever do something some like guy. that? Some, some guy, I don't even know, it, put some chainsaw it, on. It'd be that guy up there. Could be, I'm not sure. <laughs> Uh, no, no, no. Um, we, we actually had a we actually had a, a comment on on or or at least a question. You know, being able to put you know 
with that with the dropping system as well as the light to remotely control that from the drone you know i mean and again this this does make it a little bit more complex as an integrator trying to do this manufacturers this manufacturer that manufacturer have it all you know talking to each other no inputs you know to specifically take a cord from the payload unit and plug it into the drone makes it a little bit more complicated so so i, I don't want to say we, we that it's not impossible but i do know the the difficulties of trying to do that unless it's made by you specifically to try to integrate that so so it's it is challenging but just let it be known people are like if you could remotely control the light somehow or remotely you know control the drop you know but as kevin said a simple design not super expensive easy to operate easy to understand you know it's not it's not overbearing on that mm -hmm. level um and of course the the quintessential question that is i knew that was going to come i'm going to give that one to derek hogan here because of uh you know because it was going to come how much is the dragon fish when are we going to see it <laughs> so <laughs> uh we we should be able to see it soon uh, so the the uh, finalized price that we're looking at is uh, 99500 so 99500 for the dual payload, uh, which has the uh, 4K uh, 20 times digital zoom, and then uh, 124500 for the triple, which actually integrates the uh, the thermal sensor from the 640T, which is uh, that, uh, the 640 by 512 30 hertz. Uh, sensor. So mm. uh, with that, yeah, you're looking at 99.5 or 124.5. Yeah, uh, but so those we, should be available uh, later this year as well. Well, what, I know you're coming down to visit me here, or, or you know, some of you guys are coming down to visit me here in just the next couple of weeks. So for everybody that's watching, make sure that you you know pay attention to the events page. We might actually create something there to to you know talk about the dragonfish once it's in front of us. I know there's been a couple of videos out there and kind of showing a little bit about it, Brady, um, and uh, kind of explaining what what this product is a uh, little bit. And I don't want to say it's a little bit higher than, the, than than expected on the price range. You know, this is a fiberglass fuse. It's got a specialized software. It's got specialized payloads. It's 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 specialized. I mean, it, and there's probably not ten thousand of them made yet. So you know, getting this this price point down is in the future, I would imagine. But the same thing, it's like we got to get some of these out there to get people, you know, understanding what it is and why it is and what what it was created for. But you know, when I said the most, you know asked for item is something to look at while you know wander around and point at and you know all of this design is you know takes some time and and some some resources to do so so cheerio on that brett brady i think that's awesome that we're doing that um let me see i think i have uh do we have any more questions here jace i think we're kind of i think we hit most of them if I missed your question, I apologize. There's a few of them. Oh, here's a good one. Just for, back to the dragonfish real quick. Uh, mm -hmm. From Matt, from Matt, uh, can we uh, change any of the any of the flight profiles when you're flying? You know, once you have the mission set up and it's going to go around in circles, can any of that be changed besides the manual takeover? Is is that adjustable in any way? So uh, once it takes off into the automated mode, you're uploading the uh, the flight so flight path essentially from the controller to the aircraft. So if that was the case, you can loiter around an area and re-upload a mission if you've made changes. Uh, you are able to manually take over, or you can uh, essentially set down a uh, a quick mission is what we call it. So with a quick mission, it will loiter around an area and you can manipulate the camera as it circles around uh, your subject that you want to track cars, people, or anything else. Uh, but if you wanted to change something on the waypoint mission itself, you would have to re-upload the mission. Um, but yes, that, that will be available uh, essentially while it's still in the air to basically cancel out the previous mission and upload a new uh, automated mission. Okay, uh, and I think our, I think our last question here has to do with dual ops with the Evo. You know, I mean, just the Evo series has, mm -hmm. you know, if you can dual op it, um, and and again, that's a highly requested one from public safety. In some cases, it has a little bit more to do with the, you know, just having two separate things: one guy mm -hmm. watching the ship because he's not watching here, another guy controlling the payload because he's watching here. 
uh, is that you know kind of how does that dual dual uh, link relationship work? I mean, is there a possibility to do such a sure. thing? I know. I, by the way, I made a training video for everybody that's watching, uh, covering all the Autel stuff. So we're just we're just getting the expert here to ask, answer some questions and give us some feedback on that. So anyway, um, what what do we got as far as like dual linking? Like, what are the really you know what are we doing? Sure. Yes. So right now, uh, with the Evo aircraft, with the standard remote, you can have two different remotes. So you have a primary and then a coaching remote. Uh, this is uh, basically made for training, for dual ops, uh, or just having multiple people looking at the feed at the same time. The only difference is that the primary control is the one that will always counteract what the secondary or the coaching one has. So for example, if you are, uh, John, I know you guys are, are training. So if you are training somebody, John, you've got the primary and your student has the, the coaching. The student is then all of a sudden saying, I don't know what I'm doing and he's climbing and he doesn't mean to climb or he's subconsciously doing it, right? And you say, oh no, he's gonna hit a power line. On the primary control, if you pull down to counteract what the, uh, the coaching one is doing, you override their input. But aside from that, uh, they operate the exact same. So uh, you can manipulate all the cameras, the controls, uh, the camera settings. Uh, you can pause missions in the middle from either the primary or the coaching uh, side of things. So yes, you can have multiple uh, controllers. Just be aware that you can have either two controllers or a controller and a live deck because a live deck actually connects to the aircraft as a secondary controller the only thing there is that the live deck does not give uh, physical input to tell the aircraft, I want you to climb in altitude or I want you to move forward or back uh, because there's no stick input on that uh, that device. Yeah, uh, duly on top of that with the live deck because, you know, playing around with it, having a, a device so I can run the Autel Explorer app. I can plug that into the USB here, and then I actually do have some level of camera control, some settings I can, you know, some things I can do in the mm -hmm. UI, you know. So it's not not 100% controllable to move the camera gimbal around like some people expect it to be, but that's okay, you know, as far as being able to, to have, again, somebody concentrating on that, telling them where to point mm -hmm. it, you know. It, it does solve some issues with the dual payload capability, but not all of them, but it's there. It's pretty close. So um, right. I think uh, I think the only other last question I have here from Joel, um, and this this again comes into just use of, of products out there. Is there any any uh, um, any plans for the Evo Two line to be compatible with any Para Zero or Indemnus products? Um, you know, as far as parachutes go, you know, I guess that'll be the last question of today. If you guys don't have anything else, but you know, I kind of. I, I kind of tell people, you know, it depends on that on that third party that's making the actual parachutes, whether or not, you know, it's going to be compatible with the machine or not. It's not really up to the manufacturer. But that, but I don't know if you had any any. Uh, have you done any parachute testing at all with the with the auto or the, with the Evo line, Brady? Have you done anything at all with that? Uh, personally, no, I have not done it myself, uh, but I do believe that our engineers are looking into it to see what would be available and how we can go through to operate that. Because uh, as I said earlier, 1.8 pounds is our carry payload capacity for the, the Evo 2. Um, so yes, having a parachute, uh, that certainly would fall under that uh, that weight limit. Um, and, and I know with the, the new regulations that were uh, basically put forward, um, and now we're trying to go through and figure out the classifications for flight over people and things like that, uh, parachutes are going to become more and more relevant at this time. Uh, so, yes, in order for us to go through to work with these third party manufacturers, uh, you know, like ParaZero and things like that, what I would suggest is to be in contact with ParaZero and say, hey, call Autel and see if you know, you guys can work something out. Um, so because we manufacture our product, they manufacture their product. Usually there has to be some sort of uh, uh, agreement basically going back and forth uh, so that we can work together. But we work with, with uh, different companies. I mean, just for example, Fox Fury, who makes the, the D3060 and the Exolander, we, we don't make this, right? This is something that's manufactured by Fox Fury, but uh, we have extensive testing with them. We work uh, very closely with them. We want to work with other manufacturers. We've got different software uh, vendors that we're working with. Uh, so if anybody uh, hardware-wise wants to go through it and work with the Autel Evo, because we're, we're becoming a, a you know, pretty good name uh, in the industry and everybody is, is really interested in our product, we want to work with as many different uh, accessory manufacturers and things like that as possible. 
uh, where it, it makes financial sense for both companies. So what I would just suggest is have, you know, get in contact with Parazuna and say, hey, you know, give Altel a ring. Uh, we'll get together and start manufacturing stuff and uh, seeing if we can get uh, parachutes. But at this time, uh, I, I haven't tried it myself, uh, but I do believe our engineers are, are in that process. Excellent. Well, I wanted to let everybody know, thank you for watching today. Um, I think that's about it as far as our, our Autel uh, Tech Week uh, blowout, you know, and we had a great amount of people watching today. Definitely uh, great questions that came through. Um, I always love our app, you know, our people that are, are capable of, you know, asking these very technical and awesome and having guys like Brady uh, available to, to give us those answers. So thank you so much for making this presentation awesome and as well as talking about, you know, what's going on. Thank you, Kevin, for showing up. Anything, any last words that you want to say, Kevin, before we release you and Brady and kind of wrap it up today? Thanks, Brady. Really appreciate it. Uh, big fans, and uh, looking forward to uh, to uh, working more in the future with this podcast. Absolutely. Again, Brady, anything else you wanted to have? You know, you wanted to close out with here before we wrap it up. Sure. Um, I, I just want to say thank you so much to uh, to the whole RMUS team, uh, Jace, Kevin, and John. Uh, thank you so much for having us on today. Um, I'm, I'm always here. If you guys have any questions, you can always uh, reach out via our support channels at supportedautorobotics.com. Um, and and I, I do answer calls and emails, so you're likely to uh, talk to me if you've got more of the technical issues. Uh, but thank you so much for, for allowing us to be here and uh, kind of show you what we have available. Excellent. Uh, Brady, thanks again. Can't say enough, but uh, you know, I'm going to go out and play with my Autel stuff and do some more testing. Can't wait to see and get my hands on. Yeah, absolutely, Kevin. <laughs> you know, so so just just by the way, just in case you can put it in somebody's ear out there, Brady, I need a 640T. I need a smart remote. You know, we're going to have the dragonfish. So all kinds of stuff. And guys, you know, like I said, make sure you're paying attention to the to the rmus.com uh, slash events page. Make sure you show up there to uh, see what's going on and what webinars are coming up in the future. Um, we also, again, have a, a training for the Autel Evo uh, 2, which includes the, the, 8K, or the 6K, sorry, and the uh, Dual that I have behind me, kind of getting the, your hands on it, understanding it. If you guys jump into that, you can get on there on the online training center that RMUS has. Um, and, and, you know, as far as learning about equipment and learning about stuff, that's what Tech Week is all about, bringing in people like Brady again, telling us all about the new stuff that's coming, and as well as kind of explaining the technology that's out there today, impacting so many people, saving lives, saving money, and doing all of that. So I appreciate you guys attending today, hanging out. Um, don't forget to join us at 2 p.m., which is in just a few hours with Bobby Watts from uh, Watts Innovation. He's going to be talking a little about his ship. So jump back on and join us at 2 o'clock today if you can, Mountain Standard Time. And uh, I will see you guys soon. So appreciate it, everybody. We'll talk to you in a bit.